The Spectre Bride, by William Harrison Ainsworth. The Castle of Armswolf, at the close of the year 1655, was the resort of fashion and gaiety. The Baron of that name was the most powerful nobleman in Germany, and equally celebrated for the patriotic achievements of his sons and the beauty of his only daughter. The estate of Ernswolf, which was situated in the center of the Black Forest, had been given one of his ancestors by the gratitude of the nation and descended with other hereditary possessions to the family of the present owner. It was a castellated Gothic mansion built according to the fashion of the times in the grandest style of architecture and consisted pri principally of dark winding corridors and vaulted tapestry rooms, magnificent indeed in their size but ill-suited to private comfort. From the very circumstance of their dreary magnitude, a dark grove of pine and mountain ash encompassed the castle on every side and threw an aspect of gloom around the scene, which was seldom and living by the cheering sunshine of heaven. The castle bells rang out a merry peal at the approach of a winter twilight and the warder was stationate with his retinue on the battlements to announce the arrival of the company who were invited to share the amusements that reigned within the walls. The lady Clotilda, the baron's only daughter, had but just attained her seventeenth year and the brilliant assembly was invited to celebrate the birthday. The large vaulted apartments were thrown open for the reception of the numerous guests, and the gaieties of the evening had scarcely commenced when the clock from the dungeon tower was heard to strike with unusual solemnity, and on the instant a tall stranger, arrayed in a deep suit of black, made his appearance in the ballroom. He bowed courteously on every side but was received by all with the strictest reserve. No one knew who he was or whence he came, but it was evident from his appearance that he was a nobleman of the first rank, and though his introduction was accepted with distrust, he was treated by all with respect. He addressed himself particularly to the daughter of the baron, and was so intelligent in his remarks, so lively in his sallies, and so fascinating in his address, that he quickly interested the feelings of his young and sensitive auditor. In fine, after some hesitation on the part of the hosts, who, with the rest of the company, was unable to approach the stranger with indifference, he was requested to remain a few days at the castle an invitation which was cheerfully accepted. The dead of the night drew on, and when all had retired to rest, the dull heavy bell was heard swinging to and fro in the grey tower, till there was scarcely a breath to move the forest trees. Many of the guests, when they met the next morning at the breakfast table, averred that there had been sounds as of the most heavenly music, while all persisted in affirming that they had heard awful noises proceeding, as it seemed, from the apartment which the stranger at that time occupied. He soon, however, made his appearance at the breakfast circle, and when the circumstances of the preceding night were alluded to, a dark smile unutterable, uh, a dark smile of unutterable meaning played round his saturnine features and then relapsed into an expression of the deepest melancholy. He addressed his conversation principally to Clotilda, and when he talked of the different climes he had visited 
of the sunny regions of Italy, where the very hair breeds the fragrance of flowers, and the summer breeze sights over a land of sweets. When he spoke to her of those delicious countries, where the smile of the day sinks into the softer beauty of the night, and the loveliness of heaven is never for an instant obscured, he drew tears of regret from the bosom of his fair editor, and for the first time she regretted that she was yet at home. Days rolled on, and every moment increased the fervor of the inexpressible sentiments with which the stranger had inspired her. He never discoursed of love, but he looked it in his language, in his manner, in the insinuating tones of his voice, and in the slumbering softness of his smile. And when he found that he had succeeded in inspiring her with favorable sentiments, a sneer of the most diabolical meaning spoke for an instant, and died again on his dark-featured countenance. When he met her in the company of her parents, he was at once respectful and submissive, and it was only when alone with her in her ramble through the dark recesses of the forest that he assumed the guise of the most impassioned admirer. As he was sitting one evening with the Baron in the wainscot apartment of the library, the conversation happened to turn upon supernatural agency. The stranger remained reserved and mysterious during the discussion, but when the Baron in a jocular manner denied the existence of spirits and satirically mocked their appearance, his eyes glowed with unheartly lust, and his form seemed to dilate to more than its natural dimensions. When the conversation had ceased, a fearful pause of a few seconds and a chorus of stranger uh, and a chorus of celestial harmony was heard pealing through the dark forest glade. All were entranced with the light, but the stranger was disturbed and gloomy. He looked at his noble host with compassion, and something like a tear swam in his dark eye. After the lapse of a few seconds, the music died gently in the distance, and all was hushed as before. The Baron soon after quitted the apartment and was followed almost immediately by the stranger. He had not long been absent when an awful noise, as of a person in the agonies of death, was heard and the Baron was discovered stretched dead along the corridors. His countenance was convulsed with pain, and the grip of a human hand was visible on his blackened throat. The alarm was instantly given, the castle searched in every direction, but the stranger was seen no more. The body of the Baron, in the meantime, was quietly committed to the heart, and the remembrance of the dreadful transaction recalled but as a thing that once was. After the departure of the stranger, who had indeed fascinated our very senses, the spirits of the gentle Clotilda evidently declined. She loved to walk early and late in the walls that he had once frequented, to recall his last words, to dwell on his sweet smile and wander to the spot where she had once discoursed with him of love. She avoided all society and never seemed to be happy, but when left alone in the solitude of her chamber, it was then that she gave vent to her affliction in tears, and the love that the pride of Madden, modesty concealed in public, burst forth in the horrors of privacy. So beauteous, yet so resigned was the fair mourner, 
that she seemed already an angel freed from the trammels of the world and prepared to take her flight to heaven. As she was one summer evening rambling to the sequestered spots that had been selected as her favorite residence, a slow step advanced towards her. She turned round and to her infinite surprise discovered the stranger. He stepped gaily to her side and commenced an animated conversation. You left me, exclaimed the delighted girl, and I thought all happiness was fled from me forever, but you return, and shall we not again be happy? Happy? replied the stranger with a scornful burst of derision. Can I ever be happy again? Can there, but excuse the agitation, my love, and impute it to the pleasure I experienced at our meeting. Oh, I have many things to tell you, hi, and many kind words to receive. Is it not so, sweet one? Come, tell me truly, have you been happy in my absence? No, I see in that sunken eye, in that pallid cheek, that the poor wanderer has at least gained some slight interest in the heart of his beloved. I have roamed to other climes, I have seen other nations, I have met with other females, beautiful and accomplished, but I have met with but one angel, and she is here before me. Accept this simple offering of my affection, dearest, continued the stranger, plucking a heat rose from its stem. It is beautiful as the wild flowers that deck thy hair, and sweet as is the love I bear thee. It is sweet, indeed, replied Clotilda, but its sweetness must wither her night's close around. It is beautiful, but its beauty is short-lived as the love invinced by man. Let not this, then, be the type of thy attachment. Bring me the delicate evergreen, the sweet flower that blossoms throughout the year, and I will say, as I rate it in my air, the violets have bloomed and died, the roses have flourished and decayed, but the evergreen is still young, and so is the love of hearts. You will not, cannot, desert me. I live but in you. You are my hopes, my thoughts, my existence itself. And if I lose you, I lose my all. I was but a solitary wildflower in the wilderness of nature until you transplanted me to a more genial soil. And can you now break the fond heart you first out to glow with passion? Speak not thus, returned the stranger. It rends my very soul to hear you. Leave me, forget me, avoid me forever, or your eternal ruin must ensue. I am a thing abandoned of God and man, and did you but see the scarred heart that scarcely beats within this moving mass of deformity, you would flee me as you would another in your path. Here is my heart, love. Feel how cold it is. There is no pulse that betrays its emotion, for all is chilled and dead as the friends I once knew. You are unhappy, love, and your poor Clotilda shall stay to succor you. Think not I can abandon you in your misfortunes. No, I will wander with thee through the wide world and be thy servant, thy slave, if thou wilt have it so. 
I will shield thee from the night winds that they blow not too roughly on thy unprotected head. I will defend thee from the tempest that howls around, and thou the cold world may devote thy name to scorn. Thou friends may fall off and associates wither in the grave. There shall be one fond heart who shall love thee better in thy misfortune, and cherish thee, bless thee still. She ceased, and her blue eyes swam in tears as she turned it, glistening with affection towards the stranger. He averted his head from her gaze, and a scornful sneer of the darkest, the deadliest malice passed over his fine countenance. In an instant, the expression subsided. His fixed glassy eye resumed its unhurtly chillness, and he returned once again to his companion. It is the hour of sunset, he exclaimed, the soft, the beauteous hour when the hearts of lovers are happy and not nature smiles in unison with their feelings, but to me it will smile no longer. Here the morrow dawns as... wait. Here the morrow dawns I shall very far from the house of my beloved, from the scenes where my heart is enshrined as in a sep sepulcher. But must I leave thee, dearest flower of the wilderness, to be the sport of a whirlwind, the prey of the mountain blasts? No, we will not part, replied the impassioned girl. Where thou, where thou goest, will I go, thy home shall be my home, and thy God shall be my God. Swear it, swear it, resumed the stranger, wildly grasping her by the end. Swear to the fearful halt I shall dictate. He then desired her to kneel, and holding his right hand in a menacing attitude towards heaven, and throwing back his dark raven locks, exclaim in a strain of bitter imprecation with the ghastly smile of an incarnate fiend. May the curses of an offended god, he cried, haunt thee, cling to thee forever in the tempest and in the calm in the day and in the night, in sickness and in sorrow, in life and in death, shalt to swerve from the promise thou hast here made to be mine. May the dark spirits of the dam howl in thine ears their cursed chorus of fiends. May the hair rack thy bosom with the quenchless flames of hell. May thy soul be as the Lazar house corruption, where the ghost of departed pleasure sits enshrined as in a grave, where the hundred-headed worm never dies, where the fire is never extinguished. May a spirit of evil lord it over thy brow and proclaim as thou passest by, this is the abandoned of God and man. May fearful spectres haunt thee in the night season, may thy dearest friends drop day by day into the grave and curse thee with their dying breaths. May all that is most horrible in human nature, more solemn than language can frame or lips can utter, may this and more than this be thy eternal portion. Shalst thou violate the oath that thou hast taken? He ceased, hardly knowing what she did. The terrified girl acceded to the awful adjuration and promised eternal fidelity to him who was henceforth to be her lord. Spirits of the damned, I thank thee for thine assistance, shouted the stranger. 
I have wooed my fair bride bravely. She is mine, mine forever. I, body and soul both mine, mine in life and mine in death. What in tears, my sweet one, here yet the honeymoon is past. Why, indeed, thou hast cause for weeping, but when next we meet, we shall meet to sign the nuptial bond. He then imprinted a cold salute on the cheek of his young bride, and softening down the unutterable horrors of his countenance, requested her to meet him at eight o'clock on the ensuing evening in the chapel adjoining to the castle of Arnswolf. She turned around to him with a burning sigh, as if to implore protection from himself, but the stranger was gone. On entering the castle, she was observed to be impressed with deepest melancholy. Her relations vainly endeavored to ascertain the cause of her uneasiness, but the tremendous halt she had sworn completely paralyzed her faculties, and she was fearful of betraying herself by even the slightest intonation of her voice or the least variable expression of her countenance. When the evening was concluded, the family retired to rest, but Clotilda, who was unable to take repose from the restlessness of her disposition, requested to remain alone in the library that adjoined her apartment. All was now deep midnight. Every domestic had long since retired to rest, and the only sound that could be distinguished was the sullen howl of the band dog as he bowed. The warning moon Clotilda remained in the library in an attitude of deep meditation. The lamp that burned on the table where she sat was dying away and the lower hand of the apartment was already more than half obscured. The clock from the northern angle of the castle told out the horror of twelve, and the sound echoed dismally in the solemn stillness of the night. Sudden, the hawken door at the farther end of the room was gently lifted on its latch, and a bloodless figure, apparelled in the habiliments of the grave, advanced slowly up the apartment. No sound heralded its approach as it moved with noiseless steps to the table where the lady was stationed. She did not at first perceive it, till she fell, a deaf cold hand fast grasped in her own, and heard a solemn voice whisper in her ear. Lodilda. She looked up. A dark figure was standing beside her. She endeavored to scream, but her voice was unequal to the exertion. Her eye was fixed, as if by magic, on the form which slowly removed the garb that concealed its countenance and disclosed the livid eyes and skeleton shape of her father. It seemed to gaze on her with pity and regret and mournfully exclaimed, Clotilda, the dresses and the servants are ready. The church bell has tolled, and the priest is at the altar. But where is the affianced bride? There is room for her in the grave, and tomorrow shall be with me. Tomorrow, faltered out the distracted girl, the spirits of hell shall have registered it, and tomorrow must the bond be cancelled. The figure ceased, slowly retired, and was soon lost in the obscurity of the distance. The morning 
evening arrived and already as the hall clock struck eight, Clotilda was on her road to the chapel. It was a dark, gloomy night. Thick masses of dawn clouds sealed across the firmament and the roar of the winter wind echoed awfully through the forest trees. She reached the appointed place. A figure was in waiting for her. It advanced and discovered the features of the stranger. Why, this is well, my bride, he exclaimed with a sneer. And well will I repay thy fondness. Follow me. They proceeded together in silence through the winding avenues of the chapel until they reached the adjoining cemetery. Here they paused for an instant, and the stranger, in a softened tone, said, But one more heart to go, and the struggle will be over. And yet this heart of incarnate malice can feel, when it devotes so young, so pure a spirit to the grave, but it must, it must be, he proceeded, as the memory of her past love rush on her mind. For the theme who I obey has so willed it. Poor girl, I am leading thee indeed to our nuptials, but the priest will be deaf. Thy parents, the moldering skeletons that rot in heaps around, and the witnesses to our union, the lazy worms that revel on the curious bones of the deaf. Come by, my young bride. The priest is impatient for his victim. As they proceeded, a dim blue light moved sweetly before them and displayed at the extremity of the churchyard the portals of a vault. It was open, and they entered it in silence. The hollow mine came rushing through the gloomy abode of the dead, and on every side were piled the moldering remnants of coffins, which dropped piece by piece upon the damp mud. Every step they took was on a dead body, and the bleached bones rattled horribly beneath their feet. In the center of the vaults rose a heap of unburied skeleton, whereon was seated a figure too awful even for the darkest imagination to conceive. As they approached it, the hollow vault rung with a hellish pearl of louter and every moldering corpse seemed endued with unholy life. The stranger paused, and as he grasped his victim in his hand, one sigh burst from his heart, one tear glistened in his eye. It was but for an instant. The figure frowned awfully at his vacillation and waved his gaunt hand. The stranger advanced. He made certain mystic circles in the air and uttered unhurtly words, posed in excess of terror. On a sudden, he raised his voice and wildly exclaimed, Spouse of the spirit of darkness, a few moments are yet thine, that thou mayst know to whom thou hast consigned thyself. I am the undying spirit of the wretch who cursed his savior on the cross. He looked at me in the closing heart of his existence, and that look had not yet passed away, for I am cursed above all unhurt. I am eternally condemned to hell, and I must cater for my master's taste till the world is parched as is a scroll, and the heavens and the earth have passed away. I am he of whom thou mayst have read, and of whose feet thou mayst have heard. A million souls has my master condemned me to ensnare, and then my penance is accomplished, 
and I may know the repose of the grave. Thou heart the thousand soul that I have damned. I saw thee in thine horror of purity, and marked thee at once for my home. Thy father did I murder for his temerity, and permitted to warn thee of thy fates, and myself have I beguiled for thy simplicity. Ha! The spell works bravely, and thou shalt soon see my sweet one to whom thou hast linked thine undying fortunes. For as long as the seasons shall move on their course of nature, as long as the lightning shall flash and the thunders roll, thy penance shall be eternal. Look below and see to what thou art destined. Destined? Destined? Hmm. English. She looked the vault split in a thousand different directions. The heart yawned asunder, and the roar of mighty waters was heard. A living ocean of molten fire glowed in the abyss beneath her, and blending with the shrieks of the damned and the triumphant shouts of the fiends rendered horror more horrible than imagination. Ten millions of souls were writhing in the fiery flames, and as the boiling billows dashed them against the blackened rocks of adamant, they cursed with the blasphemies of despair, and each curse echoed in thunder across the wave. The stranger rushed towards his victim. For an instant, he held her over the burning vista looked fondly in her face and wept as he were a child. This was but the impulse of a moment. Again he grasped her in his arms, dashed her from him with fury, and as her last parting glance was cast in kindness on his face, shouted aloud, not mine is the crime, but the religion that thou preface. For is it not said that there is a fire of eternity prepared for the souls of the wicked? Wicked, and has not thou incurred its torments? She, poor girl, heard not, heeded not the shouts of the blasphemer. Her delicate form bounded from rock to rock, over billow and over foam. As she fell, the ocean lashed itself as it were in triumph to receive her soul, and as she sunk deep in the burning pit, ten thousand voices rever reverberated from the bottomless abyss. Spirit of evil, here indeed is an eternity of torments prepared for thee, for here the worm never dies, and the fire is never quenched. And that was it. This was the Spectre Bride by William Harrison Ainsworth.